opening uh, to our session about community learning centers as uh, key structures for AL, for adult learning and education. My name is Uwe Gartenschläger. Uh, I'm the deputy director of DVV International, which is the international branch of the German Adult Education Association, and I have the honor to be the facilitator today. Uh, unfortunately, our director, Mr. Christoph Joost, could not be with us. He follow us from the hotel, and uh, I would like to give the floor to him uh, for a short introduction remark. Thank you very much, Uwe, and a good morning also from my side here from Marrakesh from the hotel. And I will give you now a short introduction into the workshop, its objectives, <coughs> and some background information on the topic of the community learning centers. I can see that you are already sharing the presentation, or right now it's my picture. I can see, so please start presentation number one. Thank you very much. So I can see <coughs> what is displayed in the screen in the venue. So the workshop on community learning centers is organized by three organizations, by DVB International, that was just presented by Uwe Gartenschläger, and our uh, <coughs> co-organizers are PKI, the International Council for Adult Education, and the Georgian Adult Education Network. So next slide, please. Um, here you have an overview of the moderators and the speakers. For me, it's quite difficult to recognize the text on the screen. I'm not sure if everybody online can follow. So I just give uh, some short information. Uh, we have six speakers from different countries who will speak about uh, their community learning centers and their systems and share some guidelines. We have speakers from South Africa, Uganda, Georgia, Germany, Peru and Thailand and all speakers will later be presented in detail by Uwe Gartenschläger who is facilitating the event on site. So next slide please uh, as to the proceeding of the workshop uh, as mentioned i will give you a short introduction into the topic then we have inputs from from all speakers who were about to speak about five minutes about their countries and about their systems and then we're going to have a panel discussions with all guests on site but but also with participate participants online and at the end we're going to present some policy messages that have been drafted by the expert group of speakers here and we're going to vote which message we like to transfer to transmit to unesco for the outcome document mm -hmm. um, maybe Uwe, just uh, giving back the word to you for a minute how can people participate online i think this would yes. be quite good to inform so the people online are invited to ask their questions put their questions and remarks in the chat and my colleague Rafaela Kira from the European Association for the Education of Adults, who's sitting next to me, follows the chat. And there will be the moment when I will ask Rafaela what's going on in the chat. And then she picks up, I think, some of the questions and remarks. Here in the auditorium, you will have the opportunity to ask the questions. There are mics available. And, you, and I hope we could have some time earmarked for discussion. Thank you, Uwe. Um, so I'll ask you to go to the next slide. I can already see it. And there is a remark from, from the chat that it's very difficult to read. Yeah? Uh, I, at least looking on the computer, cannot read the text on the slides. It's, it's quite blurred. Uh, maybe you can work while I'm continuing my presentation that the uh, letters are getting a bit sharper to, to see. I'm not sure if people can see it on site, but online it's, it's I think hardly. On on site, it's, it's fine. Uh, it's, yeah, on site, it's, okay. it's very good. Okay, online, it's very. It, it's yeah, yeah, the so technicians work on it, Christoph. Mm -hmm. Okay, they will work on it. Okay, so what are the objectives of the workshop? So I read what you cannot read out or just present what you cannot read on the slides. We want to provide some background information in the form about the global policy context of CLCs. Yeah? And we will present different systems from different countries, uh, countries and we will look at good practices. <coughs> and we will also share guidelines for community learning centers that have been elaborated in the last years and inform about the key roles of community learning centers. And yeah, now the text is getting bigger and we can read a bit better. 
Uh, and we will also look at different governance and funding models. I think that is quite important. This is at, at the key of the workshop. So which setups exist and how are CLCs funded and what are preconditions and preconditions and challenges for good operations of these community learning centers because they differ from one country and from one system to another. And at the end, we're going to speak about policy recommendations. So. Um, for the background, you find CLCs uh, in more and more countries around the globe. Um, they are important providers of adult learning and education. And actually, the number and the geographic spread, ha spread has increased over the last decades. But the systems uh, vary widely. So some centers uh, have uh, only look uh, at adults, uh, while others look at children, youth, and adults. So the target groups differ. Um, the names also differ. We speak here about community learning centers because this is the term most commonly used. But in other regions of the world, we speak about adult education centers. In Germany, we speak about Volkshochschulen. Uh, in others, you speak about, in Scandinavia, it's more folk high schools or lifelong learning centers, lifelong learning centers in other regions or houses of culture. So this differs from one country to the next. They also differ in terms of their programs and functions. In some regions they are holistic, in others they just concentrate on single purposes. And also the stuffing and the degree of professionalization is very different from one country to the next. And last but not least, as I mentioned already, the governance structure and the funding models which are here very important during this discussion today. In general, one can say that the CLCs are local institutions for putting adult learning and education uh, and lifelong learning into practice at, at the local level. Yeah, And that the CLCs they are a level for achieving the sustainable development goals, because they provide learning opportunities cross-sectoral, not only for education, but also for many other development fields. And if you look at the global policy level, CLCs are increasingly recognized in, in key documents. And I'm going to give you three examples <coughs> from the global policy dialogue. So if you look here <coughs> at the Belém framework for action, <coughs> this was the last uh, framework before the Marrakesh in the year 2009. And here it was written that we commit ourselves to creating multi-purpose community learning spaces and centers improving access to and participation in the full range of, uh, of AIL programs. So already in 2009, community learning spaces and centers were mentioned. <clears throat> if you hop six years later, in the year 2015, we look at the, at the RAIL, the recommendation on added learning education, also the year when the SDGs were adopted. Here is it mentioned that we commit to creating uh, or strengthening appropriate institutional structures like community learning centers for delivering AIL. So we go to the next slide. In, in the year 2021, we look at the global education monitoring report. So it's not from the AIL sector, it's from the education sector. But also here it is mentioned that community learning centers are increasingly recognized as playing an important role in providing education opportunities meeting local communities needs. So you can see that in the global policy context, CLCs are more and more covered and recognized. And that is why we're also doing this workshop in order to promote them and to speak about the challenges to set them up in the long run. OK, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so we're coming now already uh, closer to our discussions and to the input of our speaker. So uh, there, there were two guiding questions for the input that we are hearing now, uh, two key questions. So what is the role of CLCs for sustainable development and to offer lifelong learning opportunities? And the other one is which governance and funding schemes are favorable to ensure proper functioning of CLCs in the long run. So that is from my side as a short introduction into the topic. And now I give back to Uwe, who will be facilitating the inputs from our distinguished speakers. And he will present all speakers and then we we hear the different inputs. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Christoph, for setting the scene. And it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce to you the first speaker, Ms. Sonia Belete from South Africa. She's an independent consultant 
and formerly worked in international organizations like Action Aid, CARE, the UN system, or DVV International in many different capacities. Recently, she uh, worked on guidelines for community learning centers in Africa together with the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. May I ask the technicians to share with us uh, presentation number two? And the floor is yours, Sonia. Thank you. Um, while they were are sharing, I would like to start by my presentation with the next slide, please, on the concept and the context of CLCs in Africa. The second slide of my presentation. Yes. Um, UNESCO, the UIL, recently did some research on uh, CLCs in Africa. And we found that many African countries have experimented with CLCs. It might be under different names, but the concept, the rationale, the practice the objectives have been similar. And so we are starting to work on a typology of CLCs in Africa, looking at the common elements that make up a CLC, like the physical infrastructure, the types of activities, target group, etc. So that we don't, it's too difficult to have one definition. So maybe a topology or a trajectory is a better option. Next slide. Um, until now, from different countries, some of the lessons learned and the good practices that came out is that CLCs are embedded within AL and lifelong learning. You cannot divorce it from that. And the rationale and of, um, for establishing CLCs is both from a local and a global perspective. We cannot view them only as local level institutions or pure literacy institutions. And when we pilot CLCs, we have to pilot with the objective of upscaling and not just staying at a pilot phase. Consensus building among all stakeholders involved is important from the beginning. And CLCs need their own staff allocation. We cannot always borrow from others. Community engagement should be planned right from the beginning, and CLC should be responding to their local context. And we, we've learned that advocacy right through is an important process to advocate for what CLCs need. Next slide. Um, and one of the biggest lessons is that CLCs have to be embedded within an AIL system and all the building blocks that make up an AIL system, such as the ones displayed uh, on the slide. Next slide. And when you look at what makes up a, a AIL system, you identify some key elements with their building blocks. And one of the first is the enabling environment for CLCs. And here we look at things such as policies, strategies, etc. The successful implementation of a CLC is dependent on the existence of a strong AIL system. And as Christoph also pointed out, the Berlin framework, RAIL, pointed out the importance of a strong governance system. So AIL policies or any other policy from agriculture and like-minded like sectors can contribute to CLC establishment. You need medium and long-term strategies. You need strong program implementation guidelines. And the courses presented at CLCs should link to the qualifications framework at a national level. Otherwise, those courses are not acknowledged. It's not validated. It's not recognized. Next slide. When we look at the management and financing of CLCs and the building blocks under this element, we can recognize the importance of regularly, regular and participatory planning between all stakeholders. When we look at budget and resource allocation for CLCs, this should come from multiple sectors. All sectors that implement a CLC should contribute. The different spheres of governance from local to national, different stakeholders, whether it's government, NGOs, private sector. To what extent can the community make uh, um, financing or financing in kind contributions? And to what extent are CLCs embedded within the existing finance and governing system? Also, how do we monitor? How do we put the data from CLCs into our national management information system? How do we coordinate and cooperate? Next slide. When we look at the governance and institutional arrangements at CLCs in Africa, once again, these systems have to be established from local to national level, across sectors, across stakeholders, 
and community centers have to be acknowledged as an official structure of AIL. And so the coordination and the complexities around this have to be addressed. CLCs must have their own qualified human resources, sufficient qualified resources. Leadership and management, not just at CLC level, but right up to national level, should take up their roles, should make sure accountability mechanisms are in place. And obviously we need partnership structures to guide the cooperation. The next slide. So the, the core, the essence is of course the services delivered at CLCs and how do we make sure these are quality services? We have to emphasize the importance of relevant localized curricula that can be linked of course and must be linked to national curricula as well. Our program design and methodologies must have quality indicators so that we make sure the training and the services are quality. The material development should support that. When we do learner assessments at CLCs, as mentioned already, it should be linked to our national qualification frameworks. Capacity development should be at all levels. CLC staff, local government staff, everybody involved at delivering services at CLC should have the relevant capacity building. And we should assess the service delivery at CLCs from both the supply and the demand side. The last slide, the next. So in conclusion, some key messages that we've learned in the African context of CLCs. CLCs definitely have the potential to become the nexus, the core of AIL systems and AIL delivery. But to do that, they have to be institutionalized in AIL systems and lifelong learning systems. We should consider the whole cycle of CLCs from establishment to full implementation to upscaling. And the implementation structure should be both horizontal, meaning across sectors, and vertical, across spheres. And we should consider both the financial and institutional sustainability of CLCs. And for Africa, since we have so many experiences already, we should develop advocacy strategies for CLCs as the main infrastructure of AIL and lifelong learning. And to do that, we can already capitalize on the evidence and impact stories of successful CLCs we have. And hopefully the guideline for CLCs in Africa that's currently developed can help to contribute to that. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia, for giving us an insight into the discussion around CLCs in Africa. And now it's my pleasure to welcome our guest who's with us today on the panel, Mr. Everest Tumwe-Sikwe, I hope it's more or less okay. He is the Commissioner for Community Development and Literacy in the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development in, U in Uganda. And uh, Mr. Everest, we are very curious to hear from you when you share the experience of Uganda in promoting community learning centers. May I ask the technician for presentation number three? Good morning. Bonjour. To Mr. Javalis is my name. I want to share the experiences of community learning centers from Uganda, lessons from Uganda. My presentation will touch on the background, will touch on the community learning centers in practice in Uganda, community learning center financing, and then I will end. Uh, community learning centers in Uganda is not, we are not reinventing the wheel. It, it, during the colonial times and up to 1972, we had community development centers at the sub-county level, which, which, which served as community meeting areas and training facilities for women and youth under the social development sector. But the model died out with time, especially during the turmoil, the political turmoil our country uh, went through under the regime of uh, uh, Idamin. The community learning center was piloted, 
in a partnership with DVV, we said, let us now bring back the good side of community, learning, community development centers. And we piloted community learning centers in four districts in partnership with DVV. And uh, in, 20, in financial 2021, because we, ha we had uh, tested uh, the lessons, we rolled out to the whole country. So experience has shown that these community learning centers have become hubs for continuing and lifelong learning, as well as one-stop centers for integrated service delivery. These community learning centers, this time, are located at the parish level to serve the grassroots. And currently, we have nine community learning centers which are fully operational. Um, these community learning centers are giving us indication for sustainable development and lifelong learning opportunities for all. The community learning centers implementation guidelines were developed based on the lessons learned. And the communities are in the lead in the establishment and management of these community learning centers through the community learning center management committees. Community learning centers offer integrated services through outreach, like in the, in the picture for the cover page, the front cover. That was the day for outreach. You saw mothers with their children uh, receiving immunization, child gross monitoring, and other primary health care services. So um, these community learning centers offer outreach services, thereby reaching the underserved, marginalized, and skilled and non literate populations. Government has launched the parish development model as a service delivery mechanism. In Uganda, we, uh, we operate under a decentralization system of framework. And now, in the spirit of deepening decentralization, the parish has been identified as the last mile where all services have to be delivered. And the community learning centers based at the parish is well aligned to the parish development model of governments. Co immense community coordination initiatives Community contribution is, has been noticed. The communities have offered their land, labor, and other non-skilled uh, services. You, we, we use existing government human resources structures to run community learning centers. The parish chief, who is paid by government at that level, is the coordinator. Stakeholder partnerships, for instance, Uganda Wildlife Authority, of the nine community learning centers, so far two have been put up with support from Uganda Wildlife Authority, and that points sustainability. Integrated Community Learning for Wealth Creation Program has embarked, is earmarked for government funding. Um, community learning centers are equipped with solar power and the computers to ease access to information and promote digital literacy across age groups. Um, community learning centers, I had already talked about the partnership with Uganda Wildlife Authority, which constructed Patamelo Community Learning Center in the Northern District of Nyoya in partnership with the local governments, which is also a pointer to sustainability. One of the interests of the community, land, of, of the community members is improved agriculture. You can see now the agriculture officer and the forestry guys are demonstrating, are putting, have put up a demonstration garden for a tree nursery demonstration. This is in one of the community learning centers. So they get local seedlings, are available to the farmers, creating income for the community learning center, but also a pointer to environmental sustainability. Uh, village savings and loan services also respond to community needs. You see in uh, picture one, the village savings and loans association activities are going on. This is the savings day for members. In, the video, in the diagram two, because the community learning centers have community radios, those are announcements which, want to be, which were to be aired through the community radio hosted at the community learning center. 
And this also generates some income to sustain the community learning center. Diagram three, you see now the, the female learner is demonstrating the literacy and numeracy skills. And then it, the diagram four is showing recreation. There is also recreation activities which takes place at the community learning center. And uh, the, those are still demonstrations and trainings which take place at the community learning centers and the participants transfer the technologies to their farms for improved uh, farming. And um, this financial year 2023-24, Uganda will have to get financing from Ministry of Finance and community learning centers, the component of renovation establishment out of the total budget takes around of $12.2 million. We are in the stage. The, the, community land, the integrated community learning forest creation has gone through all the screening processes with the Ministry of Finance and is uh, destined for receiving financial support from government in the financial year 2023-24. I sent you. Merci beaucoup. Yes. Thank you very much for this uh, interesting insight into the implementation of community learning centers and the impact of community learning centers in Uganda. In our journey around the globe, we are departing now to Georgia, and it's my pleasure to invite Nino Babalashvili. She's the director of the okay. Georgian Adult Education Network to give us an insight into what our community learning centers look like in Georgia, what are the challenges and what is the impact? May I ask for presentation number four? And Nino, the floor is yours. Yes. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, I'm from Georgia. And uh, in this second slide, it's little uh, information, the main information about my country. But because of the time, I want to continue quickly. And let's start um, uh, from the uh, what is the framework conditions uh, for CLC centers uh, in Georgia? Um, it uh, looks like um, high unemployment, uh, complicated uh, social uh, economic background, and um, over one million and uh, five hundred thousand. Um, people left country in uh, search of better life conditions. Uh, the next is um, depressed communities, and um, uh, after that, the existence of uh, breakaway territories. Uh, as uh, a result, about from three, four, five hundred thousand IDPs live in uh, this uh, placement. And um, the main part is that uh, adult education has uh, a low pro profile within education system in country nowadays. Uh, and uh, the next uh, page, please. Uh, what uh, we do? Uh, what is the CLC uh, learning sense in Georgia? Uh, the International Georgia Country Office is engined in establishment of adult education since uh, 2005. Recently, GAIN uh, units 30 CLC uh, cents, which uh, respect European model of uh, adult education uh, adapted uh, to the country needs, uh, and uh, we are successfully uh, functioning in uh, uh, 70 regions of country. In Georgia, adult education centers uh, are used uh, as the instrument in, um, uh, in the uh, series of challenges such as mass unemployment, poverty, inequality, instability, and conflicts and social uh, exclusions. Uh, next, uh, please. Next slide. Uh, Community-based adult education sense are flexible and respond quality to challenges, needs, and new demands of 
individuals and society in the area of globalization, uh, digitalization, demographic changes, and one ongoing technological development. They provide education and lifelong learning opportunities for all, um, regardless of uh, class, gender, education, age, religion, uh, I, um, ideology of nationality. They also reflect uh, diversity and strength and inclusion. Uh, and the next um, slide, uh, it's uh, information. Uh, what kind of programs we offer. It's based on a holistic understanding of adult education. Uh, this sense offer uh, multi-component adult training package, such as culture, culture education, skill education, sport and health education, financial literacy, personal development programs, and vocational uh, education. Of course, uh, and um, I want to also mention uh, what is the impact uh, chain for our CLC sense. Uh, uh, it is, uh, of course, adult learning uh, package, uh, also uh, the uh, involving communities, increased employment, new world view. Uh, poverty, um, uh, uh, poverty, social changes, and so on and so on. And uh, little information about the adult education system uh, in Georgia now. It's a uh, lack of uh, legislative documents and framework for adult education. And uh, um, adult education now is part of the vocational education, and we have uh, it only for the training, retraining uh, programs. The Minister of Education and Science of Georgia has started developing the adult education system. The aim of this uh, initiative is uh, to update the skills of the adult population to develop uh, the uh, competencies by offering short-term vocational uh, training and uh, retraining programs and uh, um, upon completion of the programs, students will receive uh, a state-recognized uh, certificates. Um, and a uh, um, little summary, uh, what uh, I can uh, and want to introduce you uh, existing uh, legislation of the country does not reflect the relevant legislative needs of adult education. It is important to have a law, uh, legislation, and uh, decrees on adult education, which will uh, regulate the adult education system in the country and at the same time will uh, popularization of this uh, topic. Um, and uh, the function, uh, functioning and involvement of our sense in the development of the adult education system in Georgia is very important nowadays for us. Most of all, we can uh, boldly say that our sense are ambassadors of adult education and it's uh, a big honor for us. Um, and uh, thank you very much. I wanted to say more other uh, goals um, uh, for us, but uh, for little time, I think uh, I want to thank you. Thank you. Only. Thank you very much, Nino, for being with us today. Uh, I would like to apologize yes, for the online much. participants. It, it seems that the presentations are very small on the screen, and I may ask the technician yes, to maybe to maybe to find another another more. format, not not just as a as a short. Uh, inside, maybe you yes, can have the whole you. screen presentation uh, visible on the in the online format because it, it's reported uh, various speakers, uh, participants here online that they hardly can see the presentations. Thank you yes. very much. Thank so the, much. in our Thank journey, you. we travel further to my home country, Germany, and it's my pleasure to give the floor to Julia von Westerholt, who is the director of the German Adult Education Association, GVV since April 2020, un, and who will share with us a short insight into how our community learning centers, we call them Volkshochschulen, 
uh, are established, what is the structure in, in Germany. Julia, the floor is yours, and I ask the technician for the next presentation. Thank you very much, Uwe, and I will try to make it also easy for the people online who cannot read what is on the charts. Um, so let me first start by uh, using this map to illustrate how Germany is uh, divided into lenders, which are regional re regions that are subject to their own, let's say, education law system, uh, meaning that whenever the federal government has an idea on uh, education, uh, the federal government needs to agree with the lenders uh, on uh, every issue. There's only a few issues uh, like uh, like uh, uh, vocational training that are uh, uh, subject to federal uh, um, influence, as to say. So um, this is also the reason why at DVV, which is the um, umbrella association of all the lender associations, we have in each of the lenders, we have an own DVV, uh, an own um, Volkshochschule association where the local uh, uh, adult education centers are members. So actually, the local education centers are members in the lender association, and the lender associations are members in the umbrella association where uh, we all work at uh, DVB. Uh, why, why could it be easy uh, when we're talking about Germany? It's typically complicated. Uh, for me, it's just very, uh, I think, helpful for you to understand uh, what I'm going to talk about now. So we have rush, roughly 900 Volkshochschulen uh, in uh, all over Germany in the different lenders and uh, even more branches. Um, but actually, I'm going to talk mainly about the Volkshochschulen. The, the word Volkshochschulen um, translated would be something like public university, public school, public um, higher public education, you could say. So um, some of the Volkshochschulen actually try to, trend to use a more international word, like the Volkshochschule in Bonn in Northern Westphalia has three different translations, one in French, which, which is uh, uh, Université Populaire de Bonn, and Public University of Bonn, and Volkshochschule. So maybe this helps to illustrate um, what uh, Volkshochschule is about. It's a portfolio of different uh, fields of interest that I will um, show you later on. So we have, as you can see, um, around 9 million participants a year, which is quite a, quite a huge number. One could say there's a lot of power on the street. Uh, interestingly enough, the power comes really bottom up. So it's, it's, it's like a grassroots organization. Each Volkshochschule is independent and has their own uh, program that is very much adapted to the regional needs. Um, for instance, if you live in an area, as you know, there's lots of wine uh, areas in Germany. Um, you could find in the, in the wine areas, in the southern part of Germany, for example, you would find classes on winery, on how to cultivate wine and how to uh, differentiate between different grapes uh, and things like that. So it's, it's a very wide range of interests that you can pursue at a Volkshochschule. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is quite big. I'm not sure you can see it. Um, okay, so this is, I actually already talked a little bit about that, so I can, I think we can move on to the next one. What um, Volkshochschule is, uh, the program uh, sections that we have, uh, one before, please. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can see the different sections um, on the on the left side. There's a bullet. I'm not, I'm not sure you can you can, can actually see it. Let me go to my own version here. So it's language and German as a second language, health education, culture and creativity, politics. Um, so political education actually. How to you know how does the voting system work in Germany? For example, was a very uh, important field last year when we had federal elections. Work and career, which can be computer classes. As well, uh, basic education, which is learning how to write and to read, and uh, also catching up with school degrees that you might have missed or might have not been able to, to succeed in, so you can go to Volkshochschule to do it again in the second try. Next slide, please. Ah, okay. Um, so how is uh, Volkshochschule funded? I, that's typically very interesting for people from abroad. Uh, interestingly enough, it's, it's like a three-third uh, sort of financing on average. So we have one-third is financed by 
uh, the, the public uh, subsidies that the Volkshochschule gets from their um, municipal author uh, authorities. Um, you also, we also have um, uh, the uh, participant fees, of course, which is another third. Uh, and then there's another third, which is um, money from, let's say, foundations, from the EU, from third parties, so to say. But this is really an average, uh, an, an average uh, um, uh, analysis, because if you look at um, a certain type of Volkshochschulen in a certain area, they might have a much larger uh, share in uh, participation fees. Um, it varies. So this really is an average. The legal forms also exactly is, is, is a very interesting and also related to the funding, of course, um, a picture that you can see below. Um, for those who cannot see it very well, uh, I might illustrate that, uh, uh, let's say, two-thirds of all the Volkshochschulen, to, to make it more easy, two-thirds of all the Volkshochschulen in Germany are in one way or the other run by the local uh, authorities. Um, and then another third is... Uh, sort of like in an association or um, a, a limited, uh, how do you say, limited liability company with a non-profit uh, aspect, of course. So, uh, but the major part is actually part of the uh, local authority. Uh, it sounds like a guarantee for a stable finance situation, which is not the case, obviously, after Corona. You can imagine that many local authorities are running out of money, of course, because the, 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 they have spent so much over the last two, two years in, in different uh, areas. So it's not easier uh, being run by um, local authorities than uh, being a private uh, organization. Next slide, please. So what does uh, the DVV do, the umbrella organization? The umbrella organization has, um, it develops guidelines, for example, for the Volkshochschulen, uh, for their local work, uh, like uh, templates for contracts with uh, the teachers, for one, as one, one example. But also, of course, and this is a very, very important uh, part of our work, is um, advocacy and uh, lobbying on the federal level. Um, there are a lot of... Um, questions uh, currently, for example, and I'll not go into details, but it's a really very, very serious issue right now for all folks, Oshun, is that the local authorities will be subject to VAT, value-added tax, starting next year. So the local authorities are trying to figure out what of all that we are doing in our local authority might be subject to VAT. And they're looking into the program of the uh, adult education centers and trying to put taxes on uh, different educational um, programs, which will then make those programs more expensive and not so well affordable for the people. And actually, the mission of Volkshochschule in Germany is to provide adult education for everyone. So access to education is one of our major uh, tasks to provide access to education. And we are very much worried that this will not be possible if classes will be more expensive by 20%. VAT is 20% in Germany, 90% actually. Um, so if classes will be more expensive starting next year, we are worried that people will not choose Volkshochschule as much as they do it now. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, I'm in the wrong box. I'm already done. <laughs> Okay, thank you thank very much for your attention. <laughs> thank you very much, Julia, for uh, sharing with us the German system and all the challenges and all the complexity of our system, which is sometimes suffering, <laughs> I would say. So in our travel around the world, we go now to Latin America, and it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Cesar Picon, who's an educational activist, from Latin American Movement of Adult Education. He, he's uh, acted as a vice president of the International Council of Adult Education and uh, as a coordinator of literacy and popular basic education in SEAL. Uh, Dr. Picon, the floor is yours, and I ask the technicians for the next presentation. Thank you, facilitator, speakers, and uh, colleagues of this workshop on CLCS. Next, please. It is my privilege to share with you uh, one of the key questions of this uh, workshop. What governance is currently favorable to ensure the proper functioning of CLCS in the long run 
in Peru. Next, please. We are not starting from zero. In Peru and other countries of my region, Latin America and Caribbean, we have historical and cultural background, as well as good practices, innovations, and institutions in communitarian and social education. Next, please. Actually, actually in Peru is in process of uh, implementation the National Education Project, PEN, Proyecto Educativo Nacional in Spanish, 2021-2036. It favors the creation and functioning of CLCS and other institutions in all regions of the country. In our conception and practice in Peru and, uh, uh, and other American, Latin American and Caribbean countries, allow, allow uh, it is a relevant and transversal process that uh, allows CLCS to articulate dynamic interactions among all its pillars or dimensions. Next, please. What are the main uh, pillars or dimensions? Pillar one, horizon of, horizon of senses. The key elements are conception, principles, vision, objectives, policies, and strategies. It is space for national dialogue, debate of ideas, critical thinking, reflexive analysis, proposal, policies, strategies, and action. It is a shared responsibility of a state and society to join efforts and resources to strengthen learning and CLS services. CLC CL is shaping up to be recognized as one of the adult learning and education national policies as a key factor of new institutions which has the general purpose to build an inclusive, public, transformative, and qualitative learning and education for people of all ages in the communities. Within South-South cooperation in benefit of CLCS, which means uh, fundamentally communitarian and social education, Peru is in this position to have a democratic and participatory partnership with governments and civil society in order to conceive and develop together a strategy project on CLCS with support of international donors. Can I get some reactions from speaker colleagues about this proposal? Next, please. Pillar, pillar two, quality education and learning in CLCS. Quality education is a multidimension, multidimensional phenomenon. So there are many factors involved. There is no enough time to, to go through all this, but at least we can mention the focus areas of this pillar. Culture and quality education. Learning culture, which implies, among other challenges, learning environment as a need to be created. Sustainable and effective efforts and investments. Qualified teachers and facilitators. Active 
participation of protagonist actors, other factors. Next, please. Institutional, institutional dimension. Uh, institutional structure and forms of organization of CLCS are defined between communities and their leaders, and I recognize it and supported by the state and society. Articulation and dynamic interconnection among the pillars. Focus areas of CLCS, organization and functioning of CLCS with learning spaces and services for learning. Next, please. Pillar four. management, good management of CLCS, and do we have some preconditions, but no time to discuss it. Let me see, just good management of CLCS implies joint national efforts in the definition of horizon of census, build opportunities for public inclusive transformative and quality options of learning and education for young and adult people, as well as for children and adolescent persons. Establish a solid structural institutional dimension for CLCS in indigenous, rural, and urban territories. Democratic, ethic, participatory leadership with decentralization, autonomy of institution, solidarity, and vision of future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Picon, for this insight and uh, for this also the very, uh, very helpful attempt to structure the conditions uh, community learning centers need to be successful. The last in line in our journey is Asia, and it's my pleasure to invite Pundramol Sutirit uh, from ONI, from the Office of Non-Formal and Informal Education in uh, Thailand, um, she's, uh, which is uh, directly attached to the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Education and, uh, in Thailand. Uh, Pundramol, the floor is yours to share a little bit uh, the Thai experience. Well, thank you. So I'm ready for my, my presentation. Could you please? Yes, we can see it already. Oh, okay. So next slide, please. Okay, so um, my presentation will focus on two questions. Let me start. So since 2009, during the period of the second decade of education reform, from 2009 to 2019, the Thai government has focused on developing CLCs as a key mechanism for promoting quality literacy education and learning among the community or local people. More than 8,000 CLCs across the country are therefore imposed to play an active part in empowering the locals with equal access to lifelong learning activities based on their interests, local needs, and uh, the context anywhere at any time. The activities with free of charge, such as literacy promotion, basic non-formal education, vocational skill training, life skill development, etc., have been essential for a quality and sustainable future in terms of lifelong learn, uh, in terms of income generation, poverty reduction, gender equality, climate change, and so on, through various approaches to teaching and learning process. In this regard, to be better provide lifelong education and learning, CLC must be equipped with facilities, learning media, and technologies, very well trained CLC teachers, and so on. Besides, 
RCLC must serve as a local hub of lifelong learning for all in the community to cover education disruption and build sustainable lifelong learning for all. CLC should play the key role as genius CLC, which stands for as follows. Next slide, please. Oh, okay, this slide. Sorry, back to the next, uh, the last one. Yes, G stand for generate learning opportunities for all people in the community. E encourage learning, curiosity, and motivation of all people in the community. Next slide, please. Yeah. And notify learning channels to all people in the community. I inform related data, information, and knowledge to the community. You utilize every form of community cap capital for learning support of all target populations and community. The last one is satisfy all possible learning needs of each group of the target population. In addition, CLC should be the learning facility of the people, by the people, and for the people with the key responsibility of offering all community members lifelong learning opportunity. Um, so I would like to talk about uh, the governance and the budget. In Thailand's context, the government allocates a budget for these significant tasks and schemes as mentioned above every year. However, it will be better if any country has a law supporting the mechanisms and proceedings related to the provision of adult non-formal and informal education in terms of lifelong learning so that the budget at least will be allocated in line with the law to extend learning opportunities to the people and to develop one's quality of life according to individual capacities. This shall create a learning and society which would affect the development of manpower and the future advancement of the nation. Our aforementioned reasons could be raised as the key issue to getting a budget for running the task in the long run. That's all my presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You very much, Poon Ramol, for giving us the insight and the genius of the Thai approach. Uh, all the best to Bangkok. And uh, now the final, final, very short presentation is again back to Christoph Joost, uh, who will now present the four Theses we would like to share with the whole conference as the outcome of our workshop. That's our suggestion, and uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit time after his present presenting the four um, uh, outcome uh, to to discuss it here at least in the room. Christoph, please, and next yeah. presentation, Thank please. Thank yeah, thank you very much, Uwe. I hope that everybody online can read the the key messages or the policy messages. Uh, I ask the technicians, please, to make a screen a bit bigger. Yeah, I think now everybody should be able to <clears throat> to read it. So um, for us, it is important that we have an outcome of this workshop, and the, tea, the topic of CLCs is uh, is very prominent. I understood there are a lot of people in the room, and there are also a lot of people online and following in the stream, and we want to have some outcomes. So we have formulated four policy uh, messages or key messages and recommendations that we also want to feed in our final report. And I will present the four messages, which have always one heading and then the message proper. And the first one is about governance and financial support. And actually, this message takes up the draft Marrakesh framework for action because the first sentence is just top, uh, copied from the draft, where it is already said, we commit to strengthening adult learning and education at the local level, and, that, and we recognize that AL needs own institutions, such as, for example, community learning centers. We would like to add here <clears throat> that we do not only recognize that AL needs institutions, but we also want to add that CLC systems need proper governance structures across sectors and spheres. We talked about the cross-sectoral approach and public financial support that should be adequate, predictable, and sustainable. This was already heard yesterday during the plenary sessions that financial support and funding is one of the key issues at stake during Confrontea, and this obviously does not refer to ale as such in general alone, but also to CLCs, because this is some kind of a delivery mechanism in order to implement ale in the partner countries. So this is the first key message, or the first policy recommendation on governance and financial support. Next, please. <clears throat> 
the next one is about the multifunctionality and uh, transformative cap capacity of community learning centers. Yeah, and, and we uh, formulated that these centers are multifunctional and innovative institutions supporting inclusive and transformative learning. The aspect of transformative learning is quite new in the debate, but we thought it is very important to highlight it here in the message. And the centers, they cater for education and learning, but also for community information, counseling, and they act as social and cultural meeting places. So CLCs are more than only learning places. The next message is about the flexibility and resilience of CLCs, which provide a broad variety of learning opportunities, allowing for flexible responses to changing societal needs and resilience building in ca uh, resilience building in case of crisis. This is also quite, uh, I wouldn't say new, but uh, we learned it in the past with, uh, with migration and also with the, the ongoing conflicts that adult education centers or CSCs, because they provide non-formal learning. Yeah, they are very flexible and they can provide these uh, quick answers. What is an uh, important message from our understanding? So, and the uh, services range from basic education, literacy, languages, income generating, vocational training, life skills, and citizenship education. But the flexibility and resilience is here the point. Last message is the relation to the Agenda 2030 or the Sustainable Development Goals. And here we formulated that CLCs are local hubs to provide education and lifelong learning for all, leaving no one behind is one of the key uh, sentences of the Agenda 2030, of the key rationale. And they support the Sustainable Development Goals with positive impact on other sectors such as health and well-being, conflict prevention and promotion of, of peace, as well as gender equality and climate and climate justice. So that this is cross-sectoral effects and impacts CLCs have. So we have these four messages and uh, this can uh, hopefully serve for a yeah. short discussion <coughs> on the remaining time and I give back to Uwe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph, for the four policy messages. And we have a little bit time left. I, I, I know this is terrible, not adult education, what we do here with this front-loaded uh, lot of presentations. But we wanted to share and give you a picture of the, of the global uh, diversity of community learning centers. There is one question in the two questions in online. Uh, and I think as we should appreciate this, our, our colleagues who are with us online. So I give the floor for Rafaela for these two questions. And then I invite you as well for comments and questions. Thank you very much. So we had two questions um, on the chat. Um, the first uh, was from someone working for the UNESCO um, saying that um, community learning centers seem to be a good step um, to helping marginalized groups in terms of education and social life. Um, but the question was, um, whether all CLCs are available to all groups who are not able to access any other forms of education um, and specifically thinking about refugees and displaced people who often do not have um, access to any other types of uh, education in their host or third country. Um, and um, there's also a follow-up to that question. Is there a limit to what and who um, the funding and resources can um, cover. Um, so is there a limit to the funding and the target groups? Um, and do we want to start with this first question or? Uh, yeah. I, I would like to address these questions to, to Sonia Belete, who has done the research uh, study on the situation in Africa. Sonia, can you try to give a feedback on these questions? Uh, in, in terms of the, the access, I think what we've seen is most CLCs do that and some really try to focus on making sure there's access to everybody. But it depends a lot on the resources and the circumstances to what extent it really becomes practical. But there, there has not been any limitation or discrimination as far as we could have seen in, in African countries. And, and in some countries, refugees especially are, are targeted even. Um, and we've, we've had in Ethiopia projects where the CLC focus almost exclusively on refugees. Thank you so much. 
Now I would like to give you the opportunity in the floor. If you would like to ask a question or have a comment, I think, yeah. Yet, but it's, it's from the uh, So the lady, in the, uh, uh, is there somebody with a mic around? Thank you so much. One, two. Thank you very much uh, for all the presentations and for the very interesting topic for discussion. I'm from Armenia Ministry of Education, and my question is related to the possibility of combination of community learning centers with formal educational institutions, because for some of the cases, it would be the most cost-effective solution, especially when we are talking about rural areas, when we have a uh, low number of kids, for example, in, at schools and kindergartens. Uh, I would like to ask if there are any experience in any of the countries presented uh, in today's session. Do they have this kind of experience of combining community le learning centers functions with uh, formal education institutions, such as schools or kindergartens? Thanks. Thank you very much for this very interesting question. May I, may I ask Julia from Westerholt maybe to share with us the German experience, if there is some linkage to the formal education system provided by Volkshochschulen? Yeah, Julia? I did not hear the beginning of the question very well. The, I got your question, but I did not hear yeah. the, the speaker in the room very the, the, well. The, the question from the, the from question, maybe? Yes, the question from the ministry in Armenia was, is how, is there a link b between uh, non-formal and formal education in the community ah, learning mm -hmm. centers? Because this might be cost effective, especially for countries who, who don't have the resources. So in Germany, is there, is there a link to the formal system? Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, as I uh, tried to illustrate before, obviously all the folks are showing <laughs> Are very different, but um, there are there are uh, single Volkshochschulen who have almost 90% of their program uh, consists of formal education. And yes, there is a link between both. And yes, um, the the way the financing of the different uh, kinds of, of of programs, of course, uh, are diff so different that they can sort of subsidize each other. So I think. The, the link between formal and non-formal um, programs uh, is very very important because there is a lot of um, there's a lot of synergies between both. Um, but I don't think that the German uh, Volkshochschulen um, uh, right now. My impression, at least, is that there is no strategic. Uh, way of, of using this, uh, I think it's really that the response to the need of the area that that then creates um, the portfolio of the uh, uh, of the of the um, uh, adult education center in that certain uh, district. But obviously, yes, there is a link, and yes, it can be very useful and synergetic. And from the financing point of view, also at least in Germany. Uh, it does make sense to have both uh, b both parts in, in one adult education center. Mr. Tumvesiki would like to add from the Uganda experience. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been uh, our challenge in Uganda, where most of the classes for adult learners, even in areas where there are institutions, they take place from the open. And when the weather is not friendly, they don't study. Uh, we have asked for permission formally. We want to try out our permanent secretary for means of gender, labor, and social development. Because in Uganda, Ali is a mandate of a means of gender, labor, and social development. Form education is the mandate of means of education and sports. These are two ministries. So our permanent secretary has written to the permanent secretary of Ministry of Education and Sports in the four pilot districts we are doing with DVV to seek for permission so that when the lower primary school are not in the session in the afternoon, the, the classes can be made accessible to the other learners. We, we, we haven't got the feedback. But when you look at the 
services of the community learning center. It is not only literacy and numeracy skills acquisition. There are also demonstrations. There are also outreach services. There are a number of services which require a standalone and unique institution for Ali. And we are promoting that um, community learning centers, as schools are for formal, as classrooms are for formal education, community learning centers should also be institutions for Ali. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. There are the lady beyond and then behind, and then on this side, two persons and the one in the front. I think we collect the questions and then we make a final round. Yes? Okay. So Thank you. First, it's yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Hello? Uh, try again. Okay, thank you very much. Um, from Mozambique, I would like to share the experience that we have in Mozambique w uh, regarding with the CLC. We are now working the way that the, the primary school should be, uh, the CLC should be under the primary school management. And uh, we, we are also working the way to link the question that was pointed. Uh, as uh, we have discussed, resource link the CLC with the early childhood uh, um, a program, so the parents can uh, be um, prepared for, especially for parental uh, education, to look for the issues of immunization and uh, nutrition, and also to ensure that the, those children that have this at attention, they will. Uh, um, enroll at the school at the right age because this is one of the challenges that we have. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Can you pass to the lady? And then uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the presenters as well. I am from Sierra Leone. Olive Musa is my name. I want to share our own experience from Sierra Leone. We have a number of community learning centers and what we have done, we have a radical inclusion policy that have been developed. And that policy is saying that everyone should be in school, all children should be in school. So one of the assignments that the community learning centers and the parents that are coming to the community learning centers have is to go into the community um, with the center coordinator to assess those who should go back to school, including pregnant schoolgirls and the like. This year, we were able to send about 200 of such girls back to school in four districts, and we are continuing to promote that. Also, the, the uh, community learning centers, we also have what we call the accelerated learning centers, and these are in schools but we are concentrating on basic literacy because there are some people who want to, we call them opportunistic learners. They just want to read and write their names or keep simple records. Maybe some of them are farmers and the like. So we are also doing that. And for each chiefdom, we have one school that is hosting. We have 190 uh, chiefdoms. So each chiefdom has one school that is promoting that kind of education for those who are literate. Lastly, I want to ask a question. Somebody talked about the qualification framework. Are you saying that uh, you are using the formal school curriculum to have this qualification framework? Do we have um, a curriculum for the CLC or it is the same as what you have for the formal system? Thank, thank you very much for sharing the experience and the question. I, I suggest we select uh, three more uh, speakers, or maybe four, but then now we, I have to close four more speakers, and then I give the possibility for feedback. And please, please be short. I'm very sorry, but the time is running a little bit. It's uh, very sorry. Uh, bonjour, je serai. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to try to be very brief. I'm a member of uh, the National Agency uh, for the Fight Against Illiteracy. 
And I would like to share with you the experience of this Moroccan institution, which is a very promising framework in the fight against illiteracy and to uh, achieve lifelong learning. This institution, this agency, despite the very low funding of its program and uh, thanks to the commitment of some uh, partners, uh, uh, despite the insufficient support uh, and uh, despite uh, the uh, lack of uh, remuneration uh, for uh, the uh, employees in these uh, uh, literacy centers, so many problems and many constraints. Nevertheless, the agency has succeeded in reducing illiteracy significantly and to make great steps in the field of uh, adult learning and education thanks to the high quality and skill of its staff and the many efforts uh, made by human resources, uh, which, uh, though in small numbers, have deployed with a dedication uh, and we have a high quality management with a lot of responsibility, patriotism, sacrifice, and who profoundly believe in the sacred calling of this mission. And this effort has led in the field to high percentages for those who benefit from this literacy program and on and lifelong learning. I'm not going to go into the uh, details about uh, the many achievements of uh, this, the very serious work done by the agency. And this is despite the uh, health crisis that has affected the entire world with COVID-19, this pandemic that should lead to many lessons learned uh, by countries, especially in setting up projects that will put literacy learning and adult learning as a priority policy uh, in the list of public policies. And let me, just, just one minute. So, so, as I was saying, decisions have to be taken, and we need to act. We need to act on the ground to translate the policy commitments of the states by setting up development model that will place the fight against illiteracy and for lifelong learning as a high social and governmental priority to give the players in that field all the means, uh, technical, logistical, and human, and give them the right financial budgets for the implementation of the programs and the success of the strategy. We need to invest in literacy programs and lifelong learning programs to adapt them to the uh, cognitive uh, level and uh, um, way of life of adults and uh, also have good training for uh, the trainers so that they can respond the interests and needs in educational terms of adults. So we believe that education of adults is fundamentally different from educating children, as has been confirmed by experts. And And so my question is, there any experiences you can share in this uh, domain? And sorry for being so long. Ours, we can see that there's a lot of uh, content in the community learning center topic, and there's a lot of uh, experience here in the room. There are three more, but please, just a short question. I, 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 I can understand that you would like to share your experience, but I can open the floor for questions only. No. No question? You have a question? No? Then one lady in the back, please. Over there. Thank you so much. My question is about uh, the challenges of CLCs in executing quality education. So what happens to the quality aspect when we talk about CLCs? 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, short question. And we have one chest question from the chat is about intergenerational. Yeah, there are a lot, but one we pick up is now on intergenerational learning in community learning centers. And uh, as, a, as a final, final round, I would like to ask Punramol about the how you in Thailand you ensure quality in learning in the community learning centers. What do you do? Hello? Ah, already left us. So, Sonia. you want? Maybe Sonia could answer? Korea? Sonia. Sonia, Sonia. Sonia, can you answer about quality? What, is the, what are the key factors for quality assurances? Um, in, in Africa, that also still quite, quite a challenge. But what is important is the way that you don't see non-formal as an excuse for just doing ad hoc kind of training that you still have proper curriculum, you have the right material, that lesson plans are correctly developed, and that you ensure your learner assessments are planned in advance. And I will try to also answer the question about the qualification frameworks at this time. Because if your learner assessments measure the right outcomes so that you can somehow link to a qualification framework, that also helps with the quality. Um, on the qualification framework issue, um, there isn't a qualification frameworks for AIL in many African countries. So sometimes there's interim measures like transfer direct, but you cannot really use the primary school qualification framework for AIL. That's my answer. Thank you so much, Sonia. And maybe can I address the answer about intergenerational learning as well to you? Is it fair or unfair? <laughs> it's okay, it's fair. Um, we have seen in, 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 in African experience, the intergenerational learning is really starting to, to pick up. We started in many CLCs, kindergartens, because the mothers needed a place to leave their children when they came for learning. But now it became a permanent service at many, many CLCs, and the need is, is really growing. Um, then, of course, we have youth and adults coming. We have farmers. Um, we have, as I said even before, it is this. But what was very interesting to see is that older people come to CLCs to chat, to share experiences, to play traditional games. And we really start to see a lifelong learning continuum um, um, emerging. So it's really, a, CLCs is a place for this, I would say. Thank you very much. And uh, concerning this last point, I think I can confirm this also from the region where we have aging societies like, like Europe, like parts of East, East Asia, where the CLCs and these structures are really meeting points for, for the elderly generation to, to exercise, to keep their health in a good tradition. There is a very interesting research from the UK that education is essential for your health as well, and you stay more healthy when you are engaged in, 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 in education. So thank you very much. I very much apologize that we run already out of time. Uh, with your permission, we will deliver the key messages on community learning centers uh, to the organizers uh, and the editorial committee of the Marrakesh Framework of Action. I very much apologize again for the very short time. Uh, but your, this uh, very vibrant discussion sh uh, shows to me that community learning center is really at the heart of adult learning and education. Adult learning and education cannot survive without institutions. We, schools are not challenged. Universities are never challenged. Why are community learning centers and adult learning centers challenged? All the other sectors of the education they have their institutions, they have funding, they have public funding for the institutions, and I think it's, it's essential for our sector as well to demand this from our governments and other stakeholders. I very apologize again for the short time, but I think it was a very interesting session. Thank you all for attending us.